First John chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, My little children, aren't you glad to be his little child? He's a great big God. And he loves little old me. Amen. These things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I want to preach this morning on Christ our advocate. Christ our advocate. What you have here where we just read is a courtroom scene. God the Father is the judge and the devil is the prosecuting attorney. And the Bible calls him in Revelation 12, 10, the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. He goes back and forth before God says, do you see what he did? Do you see what she did? You know what the devil is? He's a tattletale. I can't stand a tattletale. We've, we've got five children and we've tried to teach our kids. I mean, if somebody's doing something that's going to harm themselves or somebody else, well, let somebody know. But a tattletale is somebody, they tell just like, they like getting people in trouble. They like seeing people get in trouble. You're never more like the devil than when you're being a tattletale. Amen. And all the tattletales ain't in the nursery and in junior church on Sunday either, by the way. Amen. He's the accuser of the brethren, but then we find in Job 9.33 that we have a daysman. And that word daysman only shows up one time in your King James Bible, but the daysman was a middleman or a mediator. And he appeared on the day that the guilty had to go to court as the counsel for the defense. He would sort of fix your day in court. I'm glad this morning I've got a heavenly daysman. I have an advocate with the Father. And if you haven't needed him yet, you're going to pretty soon. I promise you that. I remember some years ago, I was pastoring there in Asheboro, North Carolina. We was having a jubilee kind of like this. And, and uh, it was Friday night, and the little church was packed out, and a lot of visitors came, some youth groups came down for that service. And we'd already had one preacher, and some folks were up singing, and God just got moving in a big way. And Brother Mark Stroud was supposed to preach next. And y'all know Brother Mark, if you've been around him at all, if he feels the wind blowing a little bit, man, he's going to pour fire on me. He's going to run with it. And, man, he just started sort of taking over that service and, and uh, people started testifying and coming to the altar and rejoicing just one of them sweet services and I remember a young black man stood up from a youth group that had come down from Winston-Salem and he said something like this he said man I'm glad I'm saved and I'm glad that church bus comes to the projects where I live and picks me up and takes me to church and, and I'm glad I get to go to the Christian school now and God's been good to me and then tears started rolling down his cheek and he said this, he said, there's a lot of bad stuff goes on in the projects. Wow. He said, and I hate to admit it, sometimes I still get involved in it. Oh, wow. oh. Yeah. He said, I was reading over there in the Bible the other day and it told me, I've got an advocate. Hey. Yeah. He said, I don't know all about that advocate, but I know I got me one. Yeah. <laughs> About that, about that time, amen, we was rejoicing and weeping with him and Brother Jeff Harmon was sitting right in front of him. Brother, Brother Ledbetter, you know how timid and shy Brother Harmon is. And Brother Jeff just started, he jumped up and said, I'll tell you what an advocate is. And for about five minutes he preached to that boy about what an advocate is while we shouted and wept over the fact we have an advocate with the Father. Hallelujah. Let me give you several thoughts here about Christ our advocate and we'll take our seat. Number one, notice the appeal. The, the appeal here is found in verse number 1 where he said, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Here's the appeal, brother and sister. This is real deep. You're going to want to write this down. Don't miss it. Here it is. Don't sin. Now, I, I stayed all, up all night studying to give you that and I only got two amens. Amen. Don't sin. This is deep stuff, y'all. Man, I tell you what, as a child of God, amen, there ought to be something inside of me that says don't sin, don't get involved in that, be separated from that, be holy, amen. You realize this morning no Christian has to sin? I hear a lot of Baptists say, well, you got to sin. You can't find one place in the King James Bible that says you have to sin. Now, on the other hand, don't get nervous. 
On the other hand, the charismatics say you can live without sin. You can live above sin. And if you do sin, then you lose your salvation. You know, both those positions are really wrong. But the Bible settles it. The Bible tells us that no one is sinless. In chapter 1, verse number 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. No one is sinless. Right. Now you hear that and you say, well, see, you have to sin. That's not what it says. Right. It tells us no one is without sin. Right. It does not say that you have to sin. Right. What it is, it's pointing out the obvious fact that we are going to sin. Right. Yeah. But we don't have to. I don't have when we sin it is a choice that we've made nobody makes you sin the devil don't even make you sin now he will tempt you and he will bother you but he cannot make you and I sin we sin because we choose to and there's a lot of people today that are saved washed in the blood on the way to heaven but they are in sin and a lot of people are there because they expect to sin. If you expect to sin, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get into sin. And there's a lot of people that just expect it. Uh, sin in the life of the believer, it ought to be like a plane crash, just totally unexpected. I fly several times a year, and when I sit down in that seat, Brother Doug, I put that seat belt on. I've never one time thought, I bet we're going to crash today. I mean, if I really believed that, I'd get off the plane. That's how sin in the life of a child of God, when it happens, it ought to be like, whoa, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. Lord, I repent. Please, please forgive me, Lord. But there's just a lot of people, they just, they've got this mindset, well, I mean, you know, might as well do what feels good, do what makes me happy. Well, that's... that's going to get you in a lot of trouble thinking that way some of you you've uh, you've bought into the lies of disney amen just follow your heart man that that's contrary to the word of god your heart will get you in a mess you better follow the spirit of god living inside of you and there's a lot of people in sin today because they expose themselves to sin the Bible talks about making not provision for the flesh and abstaining from all appearance of evil. And there's a lot of people that have put themselves around people and places. And when that happens, it's going to become easier to sin. It does matter who you hang around. It does matter the places that you go. Amen. You say, well, preach, I, I'm going to go hang out with the boys at the bar, but I'm not going to drink. You will eventually. You will. Amen. You put yourself in that atmosphere and with those people, it's not going to be long. You're going to be doing what they're doing. I'm sure Brother Rocky could testify this morning about those that did come to the mission and they did good and, and in their heart they really wanted to go out and do right but they went back home and got around the same people they were around before and it wasn't long they was doing the same things. It does matter. I think why a lot of people are involved in sin today because they excuse sin. They try to justify it. They think thoughts like, well, at least I'm not doing what they're doing. At least my sin ain't as bad as their sin. Man, I remember back in March, this transgender dude came out, you know, on Bud Light and all that. And uh, here come all the rednecks in the South. Man, we're boycotting Bud Light. We ain't drinking Bud Light because of that pervert. And being a redneck from the South, I was like, yeah, we're, we're, we're boycotting. What? Wait a minute, I've been boycotting Bud Light for 43 years, man. And every other brand of alcohol out there. But then here comes all your conservative politicians, you know. Because of this, we will no longer be serving their alcohol at our, our political events. I'm thinking, why don't you just not serve alcohol at all? I mean, if you claim to be a Christian and conservative and you love God, why don't you quit serving any kind of alcohol? And then the one that got me the most, somebody put out a tweet that said, as a child of God, I can no longer endorse what that because God calls that an abomination and I will no longer be drinking Bud Light. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so what you're saying is, I don't like that sin, but don't talk to me about my sin. We excuse it away. 
I see t-shirts sometimes say things like, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. I mean, no, you don't love Jesus. I didn't say you wasn't saved, but you sure don't love the Lord. You put it on a t-shirt so everybody can laugh at it and go, oh, that's cute. God don't think it's cute. Amen. Just excuse it away. I mean, I, look, I'll even be gracious with you this morning. You, you might be saved and really trying to live for the Lord, and sometimes them words are still there. Come on, don't leave me hanging up here, y'all. They're still there. You get in Cincinnati traffic about 5 o'clock in the evening, you'll find out they're still there. I'll even go further than that. They might come out. But when they do, you don't want to slap it on a t-shirt for everybody to laugh at it and say, oh, that's funny. Amen. If anything, you're saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I should not have said that or even thought that. I'm sorry, Lord. We just excuse it away. We make light of it. Amen. We're in a day where men are running off uh, with other women and women are running off with other men. And every, every preacher I've ever known that, that cheated on his wife, they all say the same thing. Well, she, she was crazy. Like that justifies what you did. She was cra Of course, you made her that way. Amen. Just go ahead and acknowledge. You're a sorry dog. You're a sorry man. You're a sorry woman. Amen. Just get right with God. Amen. Quit trying to justify it and excuse it. We heard about restoration yesterday. Praise God for it. But there's got to be repentance. There's got to be some repentance. Yes, and as long as you're making excuses for your sin, there'll be no restoration. So the appeal is very simple. Don't sin. But man, I'm glad the verse didn't end right there. Or we'd all be in a mess. Notice secondly this morning, the advocate. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Aren't you glad it said, and if any man sin? Don't sin. And if you do. All right, all you perfect people, you ain't going to get a blessing out of this, but some of us will get some help today. Amen. I, I am commanded as a child of God, I am commanded not to sin. And yet I have the glorious, blessed assurance that if I do sin, my sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm still His child. I'm still in the family of God. Amen. And there's still hope for fellowship with God because I have an advocate with the Father through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Let me, let me say, maybe you're here this morning and you come from a background that taught that you could lose your salvation. Have you ever thought about this? Since you got saved, don't answer this out loud, but since you got saved, have there been some things you didn't even realize were sin? Maybe it was a week, maybe it was a year or two years, and you didn't even realize that was sin. And at some point, it dawned on you, I don't need to be doing that. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, how many times did you get lost and you didn't even know it? <laughs> No, I'm glad this thing is settled. Amen. I am sealed with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, amen. He's going to keep me all the way through. Amen. I may mess up. I may make mistakes. We will make mistakes. Amen. But I'm glad as far as my salvation goes, it's said. If you ever get saved, you are saved for time and eternity. You'll never be unsaved again. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's our mediator. And you know what he's doing? You know what Jesus Christ is doing for us today as his children? He's maintaining the fellowship between us and the Father. 1 John 1.9 said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That verse has nothing to do with getting saved or staying saved. It's about having fellowship with God the Father. I'm in the family. But I don't want to just be in the family. I want to be in fellowship with the Father. And that's what our advocate is doing. He's helping to maintain that fellowship. Now, when you come to verse number 2 of chapter 2, there is a, a distinction that's made between two groups of people. Verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Yeah. Our sins. Who's that? That's verse 1, my little children. Yeah. 
Are you his child? Are you saved here this morning? I know it's Saturday morning, camp meeting crowd. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir this morning. People are probably driving up and down the road thinking, man, they done went from Baptist to Seventh-day Adventist. I'm preaching to the choir. Sometimes there's lost folk in the choir. Are you his child today? If not, it'd be a good day to get in. It, you've heard enough gospel this week. You, you ought to know how to respond to that. Amen. My little children, he is the propitiation for our sins. But now hold on, not just our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Did you get that? For the whole world. What Jesus did on the cross there at Calvary, amen, he did it for the sins of the whole world. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that would ever walk the face of this planet, propitiation has been made. Salvation is available to all who will come to him in faith and repentance. He will not turn you away. If you'll come to him and trust him. No unsaved person has an advocate. But according to verse 2, propitiation, you do have propitiation that God's advocate made at the cross of Calvary. It's available, but you don't get Christ as your advocate, your lawyer, until you accept His propitiation. So we see the appeal, don't sin. We see the advocate, if you do. And lastly, we see the assurance. Look at verse number 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. That verse right there has to do with assurance. Now, it doesn't mean that if we break His commandments that we're not saved. If that was the case, the verse would have said, hereby we do know Him if we keep His commandments. That's not what it said. It said we do know that we know Him. You know what that means? It is possible to be saved but not enjoy the assurance of it if we allow sin to come into our lives and we let it just build and build and we don't confess it, we don't forsake it, we don't repent of it. At some point, you lay this book aside, it's going to be easy to get into sin. You, you lay the Word of God aside, you, you let your prayer life slip, it won't be long, you'll be in sin. And if you let that thing go and go and go and you don't bring it to God and deal with it, at some point the devil's going to come along and start talking to you. And he'll start saying things like, you think you're really saved? I saw what you did. You think you're really God's child when you did that? By the way, did you notice the devil never talked to you like that before you got saved? Before I got saved, Brother Jeffrey, he was telling me things like, don't listen to that preacher, you're good, you're fine, you ain't got nothing to worry about, you're okay, don't go down that altar. It was after I got saved that he started telling me, you ain't saved. And if that ain't bad enough, there's Baptist preachers that preach just like the devil. Well, if you did that, there ain't no way you're God's child. You ain't saved. Why don't you quit preaching like the devil? Amen. I, I'm leery. I'm leery of preachers who spend all their time in the pulpit preaching doubt. Hmm. And I realize, brethren, I realize there are people in our churches that have made false professions. I realize that. I realize the danger of this, uh, this, this mindset of, come on, just, just pray the sinner's prayer, sign this card. I realize the problems with that. I get that. But my job as a preacher, just preach the Word, preach the Gospel, and trust the Holy Ghost to do His job that He does so well. Amen. Some of you just have no confidence or faith in the Holy Ghost. You think, you think He can't do His job, you've got to do it for Him. But disobedience in the life of a believer, it will bring doubt. And there's a lot of people today that are dealing with doubt. And people come down to the altar, they, the conviction settles in, and they think, man, I need to get saved, I need to get saved. And then they tell the preacher, I can't get saved, God won't save me. Okay, there's a problem there. Because he said, you come to him, he, would not, he, he wouldn't reject you, he wouldn't say no. He wants to accept all those that will come to Him in faith and repent. Maybe there's just some sin in your life you need to repent of. You need to get that sin dealt with. Some of you are with me, some of you aren't. That's okay. You say, preacher, you, you want to enjoy assurance. How, how do we do it? He said, we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Well, here's, here's where the commandments are found. It's found in that book. 
And that's why, that's why we preach it all the time and we're not going to stop. you got to get in this book. And it's got to be more than just Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Daily, you need to get in this book. Look, y'all, if I only ate, if I only ate a meal on Sunday and Wednesday, I'd be really hungry during the week. And some of you, the only spiritual food you're getting is when you come to church two or three times a week. That's not enough. You got to get occupied with the word. Uh, the Bible said about the godly man in Psalm 1 verse number 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Let me ask you, what are you meditating on? Amen. Well, preacher, I just ain't got time. Well, you had time to like everything everybody posted on Facebook. I ate a hamburger today. You had time to do that. Amen. What are you meditating on? You know everything going on in Washington, D.C. tonight. And here Brother Wheeler is. He probably don't even care what's going on in Washington, D.C. on the political front. He's trying to see people get saved. Amen. I'm not saying we ought to stick our heads in the sand. Amen. That's not what I'm saying. But some of you, you're consumed with it. You're eat up with it. And you ain't got time for the Word of God. Man, we already heard about the ball games and the sports. And, and man, I'm for enjoying that. But some of you, that's all you live for. Right. You come to church on Sunday, but the whole time you're going, man, Brother Foster better hurry. He better hurry, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the kickoff. I'm going to miss the tip-off. Oh, who cares? It's a game. Amen. Why don't you get plugged into the book? Why don't you get plugged into preaching? It'll save your life. It'll save your children. It'll bring revival to your church. Amen. What are you meditating on this morning? Amen. Get occupied with the Word. Be obedient to the Word. Amen. I hear it all the time. Praise God, I'm a King James Bible believer, 1611. Hallelujah. But are you obeying it? Are, are you living it? I mean, I'm glad you got the right position, but are you striving to practice what it says? And we can overcome by the Word. There might be somebody here this morning, you know you're saved, but you're just dealing with something. Something's got a grip on you. And you feel like there's no hope. You feel like there's no way out. There is, but only through that book. You got to get that book in your heart, get it in your mind. Amen. I mean, saturate your life with thy word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You lay this book aside, it'll be that much easier to get into sin. I want you to go to the Old Testament book of Zechariah chapter 3, and I'm done right here. Zechariah chapter 3 toward the back of the Old Testament. I'll give you a minute to get there. Some of your pages are still stuck together right there. <laughs> I hear them coming unglued right now. <clears throat> I had a skull field for probably 20 years. I could have told you what page number it is, but I changed. It's still King James. It's just not Schofield. And some of you, you were with me right up till I said that. <laughs> then, then you went, well, I'm done with him. <laughs> some of you pastors were about to book me for a meeting until I said I don't have a skull field anymore. <laughs> yeah. What, what we have in Zechariah 3 here, I believe is a great parallel to what we just saw in 1 John 2. Look at Zechariah 3 verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with the garments. Again, a courtroom scene. Here Joshua is the guilty party. He stands there in verse 3 with filthy garments. He cannot deny his filth. He cannot deny his iniquity. And here the devil is saying, look God, look at him. Look how dirty he is. Look how filthy he is. And you know what? God looks him over and he says, yep, come here. 
I'll give you some clean clothes. I'll fix you up. I, I'll, I'll remove your iniquities from you. Hey, boys, while you're at it, put a crown on his head. Man, ain't that like our God? We've had five children I mentioned a while ago, and we just had our first grandbaby about five months ago. And Man, them babies are sweet. Especially when you can send them home after a while. They are. They're sweet. They're cute. They can do some nasty stuff, though. Hello? I mean nasty. But you know, every time our children had a dirty diaper, man, my wife, she'd smell it. You know what? She'd just grab them right up, put them on the changing table, clean them up, give them a new diaper, new clothes if they needed to, new clothes. And she never once was like, ew, you stink. I don't like you anymore. No, I mean, she'd get them all cleaned up and she'd tickle them and play with them, get them smiling, and put them down, send them on their way to play. Because she loves her children. And that's just like our Heavenly Father today. Amen. He sees us in our dirty garments. He sees the nasty and, and the smell of it and the stigma. But we say, Lord, I'm sorry. I stink. I'm filthy. Lord, I'm sorry. And he just says, come here. I'll take care of that. I'll clean you up. Get him some fresh clothes, boys. While you at it, go ahead and crown him with some blessings. Hallelujah. That's what our God does for us. And it's because of his son and what he did on the cross of Calvary. By the way, I've noticed a trend amongst a lot of young parents nowadays. I'm hearing this a lot, y'all. It's your turn to change the baby. I changed them last time. No, it's your turn. I did it last night. It's your turn. And, and the whole time you're arguing over whose turn it is, the baby's sitting there waddling around in that nasty mess, probably getting a rash on their body. Just change the baby. Yeah. Get over yourself and change the baby. Yeah. I was trying to be nice. Amen. I thought we was going to finish on a cloud, you know, but... Change the baby. You ought to thank God your heavenly Father ain't that way. Amen. Aren't you glad you come to Him? He doesn't say, no, that's too nasty. No, that's too bad. No, you or I changed you last week. Well, no, 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 every time He just says, come here. Come here, let's get you cleaned up. Let's get you fixed up. Probably, probably every preacher in here has told this illustration about Mayor LaGuardia, but in the Depression era of the 1930s, he came into the courtroom one night. They said he would do eccentric things. and He said, I'm going to be the judge tonight. I'm taking over. What's the first case? They said, Your Honor, we got a lady here. She stole a loaf of bread from a business. He said, Ma'am, is this true? She said, Yes, Your Honor. He said, Ma'am, why did you, why'd you steal the bread? She stood there in tears. She said, I got a house full of people. We can't find work. We have no money. We have no food. And I was walking through town. I smelt that bread. And before I knew it, I took it. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry, but yeah, I did it. He said, Mr. Store Owner, did you hear what the lady said? He said, yes, Your Honor, I heard her. I know it's tough times and, and people are struggling, but the fact is she stole from my store and she admitted her guilt. She's guilty. Mayor LaGuardia dropped the gavel. He said, it's true, ma'am. I find you guilty. The fine for theft in New York City is $10. That'll be a $10 fine. But then he did something nobody expected. He pulled out his wallet. He took out $10. He said, but I, I'm going to... I'm going to pay your fine. He said, and furthermore, I'm fining everybody in the courtroom tonight 50 cents for living in a city where somebody's got to steal bread just to eat. And he took off his hat and the bailiff passed around the hat. They took up a collection of $47, gave it to the lady and sent her on her way. I remember when I heard that story, I thought, ain't that like our good heavenly father? There we stand guilty, dirty, filthy, wretched, vile, putrid. Amen. The devil's saying he's guilty. She's guilty. Look what they did. And God says, I see their guilt. Come here. Amen. I'll take care of it. And before he can drop the gavel, his lovely son stands up, says, hold on, Father. Look at the nail scars in my hand. Look at the marks in my body from the cross of Calvary. That's my child. That's my boy. That's my girl. I paid for their sins on the cross of Calvary. And Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I'm glad today I'm in Christ and I'm glad I've got an advocate with the Father. Hallelujah. I may not know all about it, but I know I got me one. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank God we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And let me say, as Brother Sievert already said, that truth, that truth does not make me want to go out here and sin more. 
If that's what you got out of that, you missed the point. If anything, Brother Doug, it makes me just want to get that much closer to him and get in that book and stay on my knees and stay in fellowship with him. Don't sin. And if you do, we've got an advocate. Praise the Lord. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.